The Vape Passion Show, episode 90. In this episode, an e-juice review of Black Note Forte, quick vape news from around the world, a New York lawmaker wants to ban e-juice flavors, an old school vape review with a 454 big block RDA, Johnson Creek, one of the longest running e-juice companies, goes out of business, next day batteries out of the UK found selling fake chargers, and the FDA released their final guidelines on free samples of tobacco products. Hey, welcome back to the Vape Passion Show. I'm Alex, this is episode 90, and I'm recording this on Sunday, October 22nd. So yeah, I had to skip another episode last week. Uh, As some of you know, I work in the digital marketing field. I have lots of big clients that you might have heard of, but one in particular I'm willing to bet everyone knows. Um, I can't tell you who they are, but this is a huge account, and I had a major project that I had to work on for them. Lots of market research and strategy, so that has been consuming my life for the last couple of weeks. And last week was the deadline, or last Friday, so I just couldn't spend time planning out this show. And I've totally neglected my website in the last two weeks too. But the project is finally done, I'm presenting it to the company this week, and now hopefully I can focus more on this show again. But yeah, I'm really excited to just get back to vaping stuff in general, especially with all of the the cool new products coming out. Um, I didn't think I was going to order the Pulse Squonk mod until the price dropped, but I couldn't help myself, and I pre-ordered it. So that will be coming in soon, and I did the same with the Drop RDA from Brian from the Vapor Chronicles channel on YouTube. So the end of October and early November are going to be a lot of fun with those two products. And something I just ordered recently is the 454 Big Block RDA, which is an older RDA. I'll be talking about that in the old school vape review segment this week. And there have been so many good sales lately that I've got some cool stuff coming, like the Pico Squeeze and the Wasp Nano RDA. And then next month will be Black Friday, which is always the best time of year to get huge deals on vape gear. So I've got to start saving some money for that too. All right, well, that's enough about me. So let's get into the show, starting with an e-juice review of Black Notes Forte. So I received this e-juice from Black Note for the purpose of this review. They describe it as a rich and smooth burly tobacco cultivated in volcanic Italian soil. The tobacco is sun ripened, shade cooled, and bursting with full bodied flavor. It's sold in 30 mil bottles, it's 50-50 BGPG, extracted in Italy, bottled in California, and they have free 1-3 to three business day priority shipping within the US. It has a very light tobacco smell that reminds me of something like wood or paper. I'm using the Cosmonaut RDA built at 0.34 ohms, using dual Clapton coils on top of the Smoke Alien at 80 watts. This is like a cross between cigarette tobacco and pipe tobacco, but more like cigarette tobacco. It actually tastes similar to the way it smells, like paper and tobacco. It's really mild and doesn't have a lot of flavor, but from what I understand from looking it up on pipe tobacco forums, that's what Burley is supposed to taste like. It's really mild and and smooth and has no sweetness. It tastes natural. It's pretty good. I've seen that people say that it tastes like American Spirits cigarettes, so if you're looking for a good transition from cigarettes to vaping, this is probably a really good option. When I was a smoker, I used to toast my cigarettes with a lighter before smoking them. Uh, Not all the time, but sometimes. And I used to love that smell. And this reminds me exactly of that. So you can get this in 30 mil bottles for $29 from blacknote.com. It's a little pricey, but this is naturally extracted tobacco. And NET e-juices are harder to make and use more expensive ingredients. So it's common for them to be a little bit expensive. If you're unsure of dropping $29 on this, I recommend buying their Ensemble sample pack for $59 instead. You'll get six 10 mil bottles of every one of their flavors so that you can try them all out and find the flavors that you like best. And now some quick vape news from around the world. So first, the U.S. territory of Guam has introduced a new bill seeking to expand their current public smoking ban to also include vaping. Benjamin Cruz, the Speaker of Guam Legislature, was quoted as saying, Vaping is a choice and that breathing isn't. No one who visits a public place should be forced to inhale potentially dangerous chemicals as the price of admission. And then Derry, a city in Northern Ireland, has enacted a law designed to prevent minors from vaping. The new law makes it illegal to sell nicotine products to people under the age of 18 and also purchasing a nicotine product on behalf of a minor. Some public health experts have expressed concerns about this new law, uh, considering that most teens become full smokers before they even turn 18, and now their access to safer products is much harder. And Dubai is now asking that shopping malls enforce the public smoking ban already in place. They have had a smoking ban in place since 2009, which already includes vaping, but it seems that shopping malls haven't been enforcing the ban for e-cig users outside of entrances. 
So government officials have been meeting with mall management to explain complaints and to enforce the law. So this is something that will probably come to an end soon. So that's all bad news for vaping around the world, but there's also some good news. For example, in New Zealand, the Ministry of Health released a press release stating that they believe e-cigarettes have the potential to help New Zealand reach their goal of reducing daily smoking prevalence by 10% by the year 2025. The press release points out that the government is now more focused on harm reduction to help smokers quit. And while e-cigarettes don't appear to be completely harmless, in their words, they are significantly less harmful than smoking. Okay, that's it for news around the world. Now let's talk about something happening in New York. New York politicians are at it again. A state lawmaker in Manhattan wants to ban flavored e-juices. This person is Linda Rosenthal, a Democrat assemblywoman. She introduced a bill last month in September to ban the sale of flavored e-juices throughout the entire state of New York. Her claim claims are that flavors attract kids to tobacco, and accordingly, she was quoted as saying, I don't know many adults who would like to inhale bubblegum or strawberry vapor. So obviously she doesn't know anyone who vapes, because just about every single vapor you'll ever meet will tell you that one of the things they love most about vaping are the flavors. And as expected, several anti-vape groups have come out in support of Rosenthal, saying that flavors are enticing kids into using electronic cigarettes, which they wrongly equate to tobacco but also making claims that vaping is a gateway to smoking, which we also know is not true. NY State's Government Relations Director for American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, Julie Hart, has also come out in support of the ban by saying that, quote, sweet products have fueled the popularity of e-cigarettes to kids, and chocolate, gummy bear, cotton candy, cookies and cream, these are all things that are enticing to kids, end quote. Now, I'm not going to deny that youth might see flavors like this and think that they would probably taste good, but we also have to consider that it's the flavors that are saving millions of smokers from dying from premature death, and that vaping is multitude safer than smoking. Wouldn't we rather youth pick up vaping rather than smoking? And of course, these politicians say they worry about vaping being a gateway to smoking, but for whatever reason, they choose to ignore the many studies that have proven that theory false. I really don't understand what the deal is with these politicians. Do they really not know that there are studies proving their beliefs are wrong, or do they have an agenda in mind? If they have an agenda, how can they go to sleep at night knowing that they are harming public health for the benefit of themselves? As far as this bill goes, I also wonder how far they would go in regulating flavors because all e-juice is made with flavors, even tobacco flavored e-juices. If a ban like this were to pass, vaping could potentially be banned entirely from New York. The bill hasn't gone to the Senate yet and hopefully it doesn't make it that far. Okay, moving on. Let's do an old school vape review of the 454 Big Block RDA. Today we're gonna take a look at the 454 Big Block RDA made by Kryptonite Vapor, which is now known as Raven's Moon Vapor. They are an American company that uses 100% USA sourced materials and labor, except for the circuit boards. So this RDA originally came out around July 2014, so over three years ago, and the price for it was around 60 to $85. You can still buy it directly from Raven's Moon for $32 or the V2 model for $45. I bought it from 101vape.com who was having a closeout sale on these for $10, so get one while they last. The 454 can run single, dual, and quadruple coil builds. This was a truly innovative RDA back in the day. So let's take a look at it now and see how it stands up. First the specs. It has an air finned cooled top cap to reduce heat, adjustable airflow control, it can run one, two, or four coil builds, has an Ultum insulator to handle high temperatures, has a Delrin side vented drip tip, a conical top cap to enhance flavor. The center post has cross-drilled 0.06 inch holes and it has a solid copper center post for better conductivity. So let's start at the top and work our way down starting with the drip tip. The drip tip is made with Delrin and has unique engineering. Rather than being a regular drip tip with a hole that goes straight through, it's actually solid at the bottom and has airflow holes on the sides. This was designed to prevent spit back while vaping. It's a cool design, but it's still kind of a cheap drip tip and it increases airflow restriction. I don't like that restriction, so I don't use it, but still kind of a cool idea. And honestly, it actually, you still get a little bit of spit back anyway, so it doesn't really work all that well. All right, now the top cap. So the drip tip snaps into the top cap nice and tight. It won't fall out. If you pull on the drip tip, the top cap falls off or comes off, which makes it really easy to pop off and drip on the coils. One thing you'll notice about the top cap is that it has heat sink fins. Uh, this prevents the top from getting hot so that you don't burn your lips. And the heat sinks work really well too. I actually vape this without a drip tip because I like a lot of airflow and I haven't had any issues with it getting hot. Tailpiping will get some e-juice in your mouth though, especially after just filling it up with e-juice. So that's the top cap. Now let's talk about the barrel and the airflow. The barrel and the airflow control are two parts. The airflow control ring snaps into place and is held sturdy with a thin rubber washer. It has the perfect amount of restriction so that the airflow ring doesn't move around unless you want it to. If you pull the airflow control ring off, you can see all of the different airflow settings you have. 
Each hole is three millimeters wide. I found that paying attention only to the side with three holes is the easiest way to set the airflow uh, the way you want it. For example, if you line up the first of the three holes on the barrel to the holes on the airflow control ring, you only have two holes open for dual coils. If you line up the middle hole, you open up all of the holes for quad coils. And if you line up the third hole, you get only one hole open for single coil. Okay, now onto the deck. The juice well is decent. It's not deep, but it's not bad. There's a positive post right in the middle, which has four holes with one hole on each side. This lets you build up to four coils on here. The entire outer edge of the atomizer acts as the negative post. There are four screws. The 454 comes with a metal ring that you can use to trap your negative coil leads, which was a really cool and innovative idea, but I found that it's just easier just to trap the leads under the screws. But that's because I use basic builds for the most part. If you're using large wire or a special build like Clapton's, you might need to use that ring because the leads will be too big to fit under the screws. And if you do try to use Clapton's, you'll struggle trying to fit them into the middle positive post. They will need to be really small Clapton's because I couldn't fit more than one of my own into the post. Building basic round wire quad coils or putting in dual Clapton's requires an interesting method for building. Basically, you need to build two coils on one strand of wire. The easiest way to do this is to build one coil on one side of a really long wire, put it through the positive post, tighten it down, and then build the other coil while it's on the device. This is the only way that I've been able to do quad coils with 26 gauge wire or to get dual Claptons in there. If you have this atomizer and know of other methods, please share because I'd love to learn about other options. This is designed as a vertical coil RDA, which makes it a little more difficult to build on than typical RDAs. It makes wicking a pain too, but I found that by installing the coils at an angle, rather than straight vertical, it vapes better and is much easier to wick. The 454 has a big learning curve, especially when putting in four coils and trying to use that negative ring. Out of the box, I had to rebuild this four times before I was happy enough to use it, and it still didn't come out all that great. It performs great though. Inside the positive pin, they used an Ultum insulator, which is designed to handle higher temperatures. They say it's stable up to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Many RDAs today use peak insulators, which are stable up to 290 degrees Fahrenheit, so I'd imagine that the 454 could handle quite a bit of heat. And on the bottom, you see the solid copper 510 pin. This is copper designed for better conductivity. It's not adjustable and doesn't stick out much, so I wouldn't recommend it for a hybrid mech. All right, now let's talk performance. Once I got it built correctly, I was really surprised by the performance, so much so that I haven't been able to put it down. Without their included drip tip, you can get a lot of airflow through here and pretty high wattages. I've been enjoying it at about 80 watts. The one problem that I've noticed is that chain vaping at 80 watts or higher can make the RDA really hot, like really hot. Not at all at the top, but at the bottom. It transfers a ton of heat to the device that it's sitting on, but I only get this one chain vaping. Normally it's not too bad. The flavor is good, but not what I'd call amazing, uh, but it's definitely good enough to enjoy, at least for me and it's much better with Clapton coils installed. What's also interesting is that it doesn't seem to leak through the airflow holes. There's a little edge that protrudes above the airflow and where the top cap sits. That seems to prevent leaking when dripping onto the wicks. If you have four coils in here, there's enough wick to really prevent it from leaking through the airflow holes. But if you're running dual coils and the juice well is full, it'll pour right out uh, when you tip it. Although I think a fix for that would be to add more cotton and spread it out in the juice well. So yeah, that's the 454 Big Block RDA. A lot of people liked the way it looked back in the day. Um, I don't think it's much of a looker today, but it's not too bad. The machine quality is outstanding and it's really heavy duty. It was built well. Everything about this RDA still screams high quality. Quad coils are a little hard to build, but once you get the hang of it, it's really not too bad. The flavor is okay. Um, my biggest complaint is how much heat it transfers to the device. But overall, this is an awesome atomizer. I can see why this was so popular three years ago, and I actually think it's still worth buying today. I'm almost tempted to buy another one from 101vape.com just because they're only $10 right now. So yeah, I'd say go out and get one. It's a fun RDA that performs well and lasts the test of time, but it is for more advanced users. But anyone can get used to something like this. Just, you just have to build on it a few times. Okay, so now some unfortunate news for one of the oldest vape businesses in the industry. Johnson Creek, the longest running US e-juice company has gone out of business. On October 9th, Johnson Creek announced via a blog post that they were going out of business. They left pretty much no time for questions and shut down the following day on October 10th. Johnson Creek has been a small business in Wisconsin for nine years. They were known as the first and longest running e-juice company in the US and have done very well over the last near decade. Uh, they've made e-juice for Blue e-cigs, Real, and many other 
uh, e-cig companies. In 2014, Republic Tobacco, the owners of the ZigZag brand, purchased 50% of Johnson Creek in order to increase production by 20 times, according to Johnson Creek's owner, Christian Berkey. In 2013, they brought in $16 million in revenue and expected $25 million in 2014. And this was right around the time when vaping started to get big. I'm just speculating here, but as thousands of e-juice companies came onto the market between 2015 and today, I imagine that Johnson Creek found themselves struggling to meet revenue goals. I mean, aside from the veteran vapors, how many people today have even tried Johnson Creek e-juice, let alone heard of them? But I don't know if that's the reason for Johnson Creek shutting down. You might also remember that earlier this year, the local government of the village of Heartland, where Johnson Creek is located, supported Johnson Creek in trying to save their business from being forced out of business by the, the recent FDA regulations. Johnson Creek asked for the city's support after realizing that they would never be able to afford the cost of submitting PMTAs to the FDA for every variation of e-juice that they made. They brought in a lot of money for the city and they also supported many jobs. So the local government decided that they wanted to do what they could to keep Johnson Creek around. The idea was that they could argue against the regulations using a federal law that says local governments are allowed to interfere with federal regulations when they negatively impact local businesses. It sounded promising, but maybe it just wasn't enough. In their farewell letter, the CEO of Johnson Creek, Heidi Braun, said that they hope to come out of bankruptcy and come back to make and sell vape products again, but they haven't figured out if that's possible yet. It's sad to see another large vape company die and to have all those people lose their jobs, but hopefully they can get back on their feet in the future and start over again. And now for some news for those of you who live in the UK. So the UK-based battery company Next Day Batteries has confirmed that they have been unintentionally, supposedly, selling fake battery chargers since as far back as July. July is when they started receiving complaints, but it wasn't until just recently when someone posted a forum thread on planetofthevapes.co.uk that the news really broke. According to the original author of the thread, he ordered a Nightcore i4 charger and found that it did not have a UK plug, uh, did not have a serial number, and the security validation scratch code was invalid. He sent pictures to Nightcore who confirmed that it was fake. The owner of Next Day Batteries, Josh Malone, posted that he did not sell any fake chargers and that people were attacking his company for no reason. Then more stories of fake chargers sold by Next Day Batteries started coming out. Many more. Instead of responding to real concerns and questions posted on their Facebook page, Malone has been ignoring or deleting them. Now here's where it gets really bad. Malone could have prevented this from getting so big. He could have contacted all of the people that have purchased these chargers and offered a refund or a replacement. Instead, he threatened blackmail against people that left bad reviews on Trustpilot and said that if they didn't remove their review, he wouldn't refund their money. Now that's illegal. Uh, he could have put up a warning on his website, but instead he responded with, quote, why would I want to drive away new customers, end quote. Other people have said that they sent back fake chargers and received a fake one again in return. This is a company that is not making the smartest choices here. These fake chargers are dangerous. The plugs do not contain a fuse, which protects the device from drawing too much current. Uh, without that fuse, the charger could start a fire. So if you've purchased a Nightcore charger from them, contact them to get a refund and stop using it immediately. All right, and for the last topic this week, let's talk about the FDA's recent finalized guidelines on tobacco products. I talked about this in depth when the draft guidance came out in January 2017, earlier this year, and not much has changed as far as I can tell. But this new guidance is finalized and out of draft form, so I wanted to cover it again for anyone who missed me talking about it before. This is still only guidance and not all of it is legally binding, but it gives us an idea of what the FDA recommends and also what they might eventually regulate and or enforce. That said, it's also important to note that some of this info is legally binding because they are laws covered by other regulations. For example, there are regulations that do not allow free samples to be given out unless it's smokeless tobacco distributed in a qualified adult-only facility. Cigarettes and smokeless tobacco can't be sold to anyone under the age of 18, and age must be verified for all sales using photo ID if the buyer is under 27. So those laws have existed since 2010, when the FDA finalized Code of Federal Regulations Title 21 came out. But with the deeming rule, which went into effect on August 2016, this gave the FDA the authority to further regulate all tobacco products similarly, whether smokeless or not. That means those previous regulations do apply to vaping too. In the new finalized guidelines, the FDA clarifies that all components, materials, and even software are a covered tobacco product. That includes atomizers, e-juices, devices, coils, and probably other parts. The exception to this are accessories. The FDA defines accessories as products that are used for tobacco products but that do not contain tobacco and that do not alter performance or characteristics of the tobacco product. 
The FDA isn't exactly clear what that might be, but maybe something like the screws on an atomizer. They also define accessories as products that do alter a tobacco product, but are used to control moisture or temperature of a stored product. This sounds to me like they're referring to humidors for cigars. And finally, accessories can be products that alter tobacco products, but solely provide an external heating source, but not to maintain combustion. I don't know how the FDA is classifying combustion. Our coils maintain heat, but not combustion, since nothing is lit on fire. But I think this most likely refers to lighters. So who do these recommendations apply to? I know a lot of people are wondering if reviewers will be allowed to keep doing what they're doing. So first, the FDA defines distributors as any person who further distributes a tobacco product at any point between the sale of the device and the buyer receiving it. I believe this excludes reviewers, since reviews happen before the sale. I also don't believe that reviewers would fall under the manufacturer or retailer labels. So from what I can tell, reviewers are mostly in the clear, unless they sell products, which I think is technically the case if a reviewer does giveaways. Doing a giveaway would probably classify a reviewer as a distributor, and maybe even a retailer, since the FDA requires that no products are given away for free, and must be given away in a transaction. Now let's talk about this free sample ban. This says that no manufacturer, distributor, or retailer can distribute or cause to distribute any free samples of tobacco products. That statement about no company being allowed to cause to distribute would probably mean that a company is not allowed to distribute samples through a third party such as a reviewer or a blogger. There's one exception here, and that's for smokeless tobacco products. If in a qualified adult-only facility, in their words, free samples are allowed. I've seen some questions on this too, and what the FDA considers to be a qualified adult-only facility, this is defined in the FDA's Code of Federal Regulations, Title 21. To be a qualified facility, there must be a law enforcement officer or security guard to check IDs, the facility cannot serve alcohol, it can't be in close proximity to a space primarily used by youth, it must be a temporary structure designated for the purpose of free samples, the space must be covered with an opaque material so that people outside cannot see, and tobacco advertising cannot be seen from the outside of the building. All of these requirements would probably rule out most vape shops. I can only think of a couple examples, such as strip clubs that don't serve alcohol, or black tents set up in local street fairs. I've seen Marlboro with black tents downtown at events like the Oktoberfest, so I think that's what that is. Based on everything that I've already said, we can imply that pretty much all vape equipment is prohibited from being given away as a sample, but the guidance document clarifies that this, this does include atomizers and e-liquids. And to shore it all up, they require that all tobacco products are sold to people meeting the legal purchase age and using photo IDs. You've probably seen many giveaways in the last year that require a fee and photo ID, and this is why. A tobacco product can only be given to someone through a transaction, as if they are a retailer. This transaction must be monetary. The guidelines also cover coupons, membership, and reward programs, and giveaways. Free samples are allowed in these instances, but only if the free product is given away during a transaction. And finally, business-to-business -business exchanges. I've seen many people saying that this is the end of giving away free products to reviewers, uh, companies giving products to reviewers. This section existed in the original draft guidance and it hasn't changed. The FDA's recommendations for business to business exchanges says that businesses are not prohibited from distributing free samples in limited quantities, for example, to market or raise awareness of the product when it's part of an effort to sell or market a product to that business. I think a product reviewer would fall into this definition, which means reviewers can still receive free products. So that's it. I don't think much has changed, if anything at all, from the original draft guidance. But since this is such a popular topic now, I thought I'd cover it again. Okay, that's all I have for this week. You'll find the show notes for this episode on baitpassion.com. Just do a search for episode 90. If you want to support this show, consider donating to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash baitpassion. You can follow me on Twitter at baitpassion, and I'm also on Facebook. If you like this weekly show, please consider giving me a thumbs up on the video, and subscribe to my channel if you're not already a subscriber. You can also subscribe to the podcast version of this show on either iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. If you'd like to get notifications of new reviews or of this show, you can sign up to receive my weekly email on vapepassion.com. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me or leave a comment on one of my videos. All right, I'll see you next week.